So the world is full of experts, right? Like pathologists who can diagnose diseases, uh, construction workers who know that if a certain tube is more than 40% obstructed, you have to turn that machine off like right now. Um, people who work in support and know how to like kind of triage tickets. And you know, one of the exciting things about kind of the past few years is that it's become increasingly easy for people who want to take something that they know how to do and teach it to a machine. I think the big dream is really that anybody could be able to go and do that. That's what I spent my time on in the past few years. I worked on the team that launched Cognitive Services, and I spent the past few years working on customvision.ai. It's a tool for building image uh, classifiers and object detectors. Um, but you know, it really has never been easier to build machine learning models. Right? Like the tooling is really good. We're all here at TensorFlow World. Uh, computational techniques have gotten faster. You know, transfer learning easier to use. You have access to compute in the cloud, um, and then educational materials have like never been better. Right? One of my hobbies is to go and like browse the fast.ai forums just to see what learners are building, and it's completely inspiring. That being said, it's actually still really hard to build a machine learning model. In particular, it's hard to build robust production-ready models. So I've worked with hundreds, actually at this point, thousands of customers uh, who are trying to automate some particular task. And a lot of these projects fail. Um, you know, it's, it's really easy to build your first model. And sometimes it's actually kind of a trick, right? Like you can get something astonishingly good in a couple of minutes. You get some data off the web, uh, you know, like model.fit, and like a few minutes later, I have a model that like does something, and it's kind of uncanny. Uh, but getting that to be robust enough to use kind of in a real environment is actually really tough. Um, so the first problem people run into is actually hard to transfer your knowledge to a machine. So like this might seem trite, right? But when people first train object detectors, actually a lot of people don't put bounding boxes around every single object. Like the model doesn't work. Um, or they get stuck on like how kind of the kind of parsimoniousness. So for example, you know, one guy you know at Seattle, people like the Seahawks, wanted to train a Seahawks class of, uh, a detector. You know, puts bounding boxes about, around a bunch of football players and discovers that he's actually really kind of built a football person detector as opposed to a Seahawks detector. Like gets really upset when he kind of uploads another uh, information from another team because the model didn't have that semantic knowledge that the user had. And so like. You know, this is stuff you can document away, right? Like you can kind of learn this in your first hour or so. But it speaks to the unnaturalness of the way in which we train models today. Like when you teach something to a computer, you're having to kind of give it data that represents in some way distribution. That's not how you and I would normally teach something. And it, it really kind of trips people up a lot. Uh, but sure, say you grok that, you figure it out, you figure out, all right, the problem is building a data set. That's really hard to do too. Um, and so I want to walk through kind of one, one kind of hypothetical case. Uh, so we had a customer, and what they really wanted to do uh, was recognize when people had uploaded to their online photo store, like something that might be like personally identifiable information. So for example, if you'd uploaded a photo of a credit card or a photo of your passport. So to start this off, they scraped some web data, right? You just like go, you use kind of like a search, a search uh, API, and you get a bunch of images of credit cards off the web. Do evaluations, all right, looks like we're going to have maybe a 1% false positive rate. Well, that's not so good. I got a million user images. I want to kind of run this on. Suddenly, I have 10,000 sort of potential false positives. So they kind of, but they build a model. Let's see how it goes. And when they try it out on real user data, it turns out that the actual false positive rate, as you might expect, is much, much, much higher. All right, so now the user has to take another round. So now let's add some negative classes, right? We want to be able to kind of make examples of other kinds of documents, sort of non-credit card things, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still OK, right? We're on day one or day two of the project. Like, this still feels good. You know, we're able to kind of make progress. It's a little more tedious. Second round. Uh, I think you guys kind of know where this is going. Like, it doesn't work. Uh, you know, still you kind of an un unacceptably high number of negative examples are coming up, way too many false positives. Uh, so now we kind of go into kind of stage three of the experience of trying to build kind of a usable model. Uh, which is, all right, let's collect uh, some more data. From, or let's go kind of label some more data. It starts to get really expensive, right? Now something that I thought was going to take me a day in the first round, I'm on like, you know, day seven of like getting a bunch of labelers, trying to get like MTurk to work, um, and like labeling kind of very large amounts of data. Turns out, model still didn't work. Uh, so the good news 
was at this point, somebody said, all right, well, let's try uh, one of these kind of like interpretability techniques that is saliency visualization. And it turns out, the problem was thumbs. Uh, so when you are using kind of, when people take photos, uh, like on their phone, of something like a document, uh, they're usually holding it, which is like not what you see in web scraped images, for example, but it's kind of what you tend to do. Uh, so it turned out that they had basically built a classifier that recognized, are you holding something, and is your thumb in the picture? Well, that was not the goal, but okay. Um, but this isn't just kind of a one-off problem. It happens all the time. Uh, so for example, there's that really famous Nature paper uh, from 2017 where they were doing uh, like dermatology images, and they kind of discover, all right, well, uh, having a ruler in an image of a mole is actually a very good signal uh, that that might be cancerous. So you might think we learned from that, except just a couple weeks ago, I think Walker et al. published another paper uh, where they said having surgical markings uh, in an image, so having like a little kind of like marked up things around a mole, uh, also tended to kind of trip up the classifier because, not unsurprisingly, you know, people don't tend to kind of like, the training data didn't have any marked up skin for people that didn't have kind of cancerous moles. Uh, and a lot of people, I think, particularly as people uh, sometimes on our team, sometimes look at that and say it's, it's user error, it's human error, right? They weren't building the right distribution of data. But that's like extremely hard to do, even for experts, and even harder to do for somebody who's just getting started. The reality is that like real world environments are incredibly complex. Like this is where projects die. Like out of domain problems, which most problems people want to actually do something kind of in a real world environment, whether it's a camera, a microphone, a website where kind of user inputs are unconstrained, are incredibly challenging to build good data for. Um, one of my kind of favorite examples had a customer who uh, had built a system, uh, kind of like camera and IoT camera, and one day it hails. Uh, and it turns out that like it just hadn't hailed in this town before. Model fails, uh, and like you can't expect people to have had data for hail. Uh, luckily, you know they had a system of multiple sensors, they had other kinds of validation, a human in the loop. It all worked out. Um, but this sort of thing is really challenging to do. Like rare events, right? Like if I want to recognize explosions, like how much data am I going to have from explosions? Uh, or we had a customer who's doing hand tracking. Uh, Turned out the model failed the first time somebody with a hand tattoo used it. There aren't that many people with hand tattoos, but you still want your model to work in that case. And so look, there's a lot of techniques for being able to do this better, um, but I think it's like worth recognizing that it's actually really hard to build a model, and it's an important problem. Once you build a model, you've got to figure out if it's going to work. A lot of the kind of great work here is happening in the fairness and bias literature, but there's kind of an overall impact for any customer or any person who's trying to build uh, a high-quality model. One of the big problems is that aggregate statistics hide failure conditions. Uh, so you might have, you might get this kind of this beautiful PR curve. Uh, even the slices that you have look really great. Uh, and then it turns out that you, know, you don't actually have a data set with all the features uh, kind of in your, your model. So let's say you're doing speech. You, know, you may not have actually created a data set that says, OK, well, you know, this is a woman. This is a woman with an accent or a child with an accent. All these kind of like sort of subclasses become extremely important, and it becomes very expensive and difficult to actually go and figure out kind of where your model is failing. And look, a lot of techniques for this, you know, sampling techniques, pairing kind of uninterpretable models with interpretable models, things that you can do. But it's super challenging for a beginner uh, to kind of figure out what their problems might be, and even for experts, right? Like you see, like these problems come up in kind of real-world systems all the time. Um, finally, when you have a model, uh, it can be tough to actually figure out what to do with it, right? Most of the Programs that you use don't have probabilistic outputs in the real world. What does it mean for something to be 70% likely or to have seven or eight kind of chained models in a row? You know, it might be more obvious for you, but for kind of an end user, it can actually be hard to figure out what actions you should take. Um, and so I think for me, look, nothing I've said today I think is particularly novel for the folks in this room. Like you've gone through all of these challenges before. You've built a model, you've built a data set, you probably built it 18 times, finally gotten it to work. Um, but I had a boss who used to say, that problems are inspiring. And for me, there isn't a problem that is more inspiring than figuring out how can we help anybody who wants to automate some problem be able to ha do so and be able to train a machine and have like a robust production-ready model. And so I can't think of a more fun problem, and I can't think of a more fun problem to work on with everybody in this room. Thanks.